So Melanie McWhorter has been consulting with photographers for almost two decades. She has gained a reputation as a knowledgeable photography professional, has been interviewed about photography in numerous print and online publications, including PDN, NPR's The Picture Show, and she has curated exhibitions, including Trust the Story at the Baldwin Photographic Gallery, has judged the prestigious photographic competitions, including Photographia, Fo Photo Festival de Roma's Book Prize, has reviewed portfolios of the New England Por Portfolio Reviews, Photographia, Photo Lucida, Review Santa Fe, and she will be reviewing at Exposure this year. She has taught and lectured at numerous venues, including the Santa Fe Workshops, Photo NOLA, and the University of North Texas. After moving to Mexico in 1997, she managed the internationally recognized Photo Eye Bookstore and Project Space until 2016. She consults at www.melaniemcwarder.com and sells photo books at grenadeinajar.com. We will put all of these in the chat, but thank you so much for being here, Melanie. We're so happy to, to have you. Yeah, thanks so much, Sarah, and thanks to the um, uh, the LACP for having me, and thanks for all you guys for attending. And um, Sarah, I'll like do one correction, but I moved oh, okay. to New Mexico, I think it came. Oh, did I? Mexico? Okay, great. She's in New Mexico. Yeah, so I'm in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and um, I um, I used to start a lot of my talks. Um, showing uh, when I was at Photo Eye, showing the many, many book covers of the books that we kind of listed during the course of the year. And usually it was up to maybe 800 or 1,000 books that um, Photo Eye had listed in its database. I think Photo Eye still lists uh, um, and sells probably and markets about 500 books a year, just some of their emails, just to kind of give you an idea of how many books that are um, that are out there that are being produced. So I don't know if a lot of you are um, coming to this where you're thinking about publishing your own book or not, but I would say that um, think of your book as to it to be an outstanding book object. Um, and another thing that that may gain um, sales is the photographer's reputation and uh, and I imagine that a lot of you since this you're visiting here you this may be one of your earlier books or your first book and then also the subject and the content of the book so those are some of the things that might make it um, uh, might make it incredibly successful so I would really um, just strongly encourage you to think about the um, the design of the book and it may be your only one so make it a really great object so I'll tell you a little bit more about me. Um, I actually did school photography for a little while in Charleston, South Carolina. If you can tell the accent, you'll especially hear it when I say Dan Farnham, which is like two or three syllables, I think, for just the word, just the name Dan. Um, and I was invited to do dude ranch photography in Jackson, Wyoming after that. And also being a Southern girl, I started hearing stories about Jackson being uh, minus 20, minus 40 below. And I said, there's no way I'm staying here. So I decided to move to Santa Fe, New Mexico, primarily to learn to snowboard, interestingly, and then also to learn a lot more about photography. Um, so when I, when I got here, I ended up just showing up at the door at PhotoEye. And Rickson Reed, who was the owner and who is still the owner for over 40 years, he interviewed me that day and um, gave me a job. I think soon after he called me like later in the day. I started out doing receiving and eventually worked my way up to be the first one to ever have the um, bookstore division manager position at Photo Eye. So I was there for about 18 years. And it was a difficult decision to leave, but I figured it was about time for me to move on at that point. And I started doing my own consulting business. I had been doing a little bit of consulting with photographers before that point, but I kind of, um, kind of launched off at that point and that became the, uh, not full time, but I do do it pretty regularly now. Um, when I work with a lot of artists now, um, I was kind of amazed when I sent out the email of uh, all the requests coming in from photographers and they were varied. Some of the things I've done is preparing for portfolio reviews, uh, creating exhibition layouts, defining a photographer's project, um, also uh, finding, helping them find their, their passion in their work, bringing a personal story into the project. Um, also looking at uh, simple things like pricing, additions, mediums, dimensions. And um, then of course, given my uh, photo book background, a lot of the artists wanted me to work with them on photo books. They approached me at different steps along the way and most of them though have come to me with completed projects. Um, they want, they usually want help kind of doing some sequencing, editing, looking for publishers, um, 
sometimes different letters like donor letters and working on artist statements and book descriptions. So for this evening, I'm gonna show you three different book projects that I worked on with some of my clients what steps in the process, when they kind of started to approach me, uh, how we refined it a little, and um, how if they hadn't already made the decision to self-publish or to work with a publisher, kind of how we went about the process in navigating this. One thing that I wanted to point out, there was a big question, I just finished teaching a workshop with Santa Fe Workshops today, and one uh, big thing that was brought up that is kind of a weakness a lot of times in some of these workshops and these um, talks is the idea of marketing. So I just wanted to talk about, um, I don't know where, of course, and I will not probably find out tonight where a lot of you are in the process of um, your work, but marketing is, is continually an ongoing process. So, um, so some of the projects that I've worked with are new and they're just being released and um, marketing is a very difficult beast to tackle. Um, there's some consultants and agents who you can work with to help you with this, but I would say it's, um, it's also like networking and it goes hand in hand with creation. So you're, you've kind of got to start the process and you got to be willing to put yourself out there. Don't be afraid to sell yourself and your work. Matt Schallenberger, who is one of the ones I'll show tonight, his work, um, he, he talked about that a little bit. He spoke in my workshop about you just got to put ego aside and you've got to put yourself out there. You've got to separate your work. And he didn't necessarily say this, but almost think of it a little bit as a, um, a product and don't be too prideful because photography is a subjective thing. So you have to have separation, but then you also have to be able to tell people why this thing is amazing, why my work is amazing. And yes, I made it, um, but I want you to buy it or I want you to be part of the team to help me sell it and help me sell myself. So, so you start from conception to creation to completion and beyond. And so as soon as you start this, like Sarah was talking about earlier when we came on, we met I think in 2009 and we still have a relationship with each other at a portfolio review. So continue to network and continue to foster connections and continue like marketing is a process that goes on and on forever. So I'll talk a little bit about that later on, but there is no magic bullet. You kind of got to do your research and you got to be willing to put yourself out there. So the, um, I am going to pull up my screen and fantastic. So I'm going to see if I can go through it. Ah, oh, awesome. Yay. Um, that always freaks my dog out when I sing sometimes too. You don't want to hear me sing much more than that, that my voice is horrible. So um, the projects that I'm going to show you this evening, so there's a little contact info if you want that. I'll show it again at the end if you want to write it down and she'll put, she can put it in the bio as well. But um, the projects that I'm going to, um, and I'll leave this up so you guys can look at it uh, and then I'll talk about it a little bit too. Um, the when, when photographers come to me a lot of times and they, I, I usually kind of come back at them with an, a long series of questions. They'll say, oh, I'm thinking about this and this. And so I'll kind of fill in the gaps. So like, well, I need a lot more information from you about this. So what I was saying earlier is always like, keep thinking about marketing in your mind, keep thinking about expanding your audience and who is your audience in the first place for your project or your book, um, especially if you're working with a publisher and if you're selling them yourself, you wanna know who the audience is and how many of those things you can sell before you're like screaming at these boxes of books behind your door in the hallway after they're still sitting there two years later. Um, uh, working on your networking, working on your fundraising ideas. I'll talk a little bit about fundraising ideas as I go through some of these clients. Uh, um, my clients and uh, kind of friends um, and some of their work and then continue to think about sales venues and exhibition venues. And these are some of the topics that we kind of will hit on uh, when, when photographers will come to me um, and some of the things I'll assist them with. Um, so maybe if I come to some of these slides where there's a little bit of text, I'll try and pause on them a little bit so you can um, write a little bit of them down if you want. But um, I'm going to go on just a little bit now. And I understand it'll maybe be recorded to share later. So, so the first one I want to talk about, um, there's three projects I'm going to talk about. Dan Farnham is an educator. He lives in Tulsa. And this is his book, Young Blood. He grew up in Detroit, um, where the project is centered. 
There's also Matt Schallenberger, whose name I've mentioned a couple times. He is an actor and now stay at home dad uh, with his adorable daughter, Bruna, who's also a dancer and singer. Uh, he's an amazing view camera photographer. He um, lives um, in LA, I believe now, and he grew up in Hawaii. Um, and then there's uh, Nicole Jean Hill. She's an educator at Humboldt University, and she's been working with the archives of a woman named Laura Webb Nichols, who the book, uh, her work is the subject of the book. And she's a female photographer who photographed an encampment, Wyoming in the late 1800s, up until I believe 1962. And this archive is about 24,000 images in total. So, um, First one I'll start with is Dan Farnham. Some of the things that we worked on together, uh, the way that I work with artists is very collaborative usually. So it's very organic, like they usually come to me and then like I said, I throw out a bunch of questions and then it's kind of responsive and goal oriented usually. So with Dan, we worked on some of these things together, um, portfolio review presentation, publisher search. We did a phone conference and kind of some of the negotiations with the publisher and also his budget. So his project, um, and we also put together a book proposal. I wanted to show this to you guys too. So his project, I'll tell you a little bit about it first and then we'll look at the slide a little more. That'll wait, um, it'll leave it up on the screen so you guys can look at it. Um, and take some notes if you want. Um, Dan Farnham, um, his, his uh, project focuses on the ruins of the city of Detroit and it's called Young Blood. And it focused primarily on youth. So I see a lot of the people who are portrait that are photographed in his uh, work as kind of almost surrogates for himself. And he also was able to approach them too because they were a lot of them were very similar um, to, and especially since he grew up around there. So they're in Saginaw, Flint, Lansing, Grand Rapids, and um, Ypsilanti. I had to look up how to pronounce that one on the internet before I did it. So Ypsilanti. Um, and he also photographed the urban landscape around him. So it's not just about the decay of that area, but it's about um, the culture of the area too. So I met him in a portfolio review. He lives in Tulsa. He's an educator. Um, when I met him, he talked about wanting a traditionally bound book with a very easy cadence, and he actually did the design himself, and I'll show you a little bit more of that. Um, we put together a book proposal, and we came up with a list of about five to eight publishers who we thought would be a good fit for him. Um, and then we um, put this together along with a cover letter, which I think it's very professional to include a cover letter, too, so it also addresses the publishers, it starts in the negotiation and it tells them why, uh, just like a cover letter for a resume, why you would be a good fit for them and what you could actually do for them too. So um, the, these are some of the things that we put in it. You wanna include your book proposal. I've pulled some of these um, content off of sites like Radius Books and University of Texas Press. They both are ones that I use as examples that have really good submissions. But these are some things that publishers actually ask for on their site get some water and I, I was thinking earlier that I like I have pretzels but right before the talk and it makes me think of Seinfeld of like these pretzels are making me thirsty <laughs> I knew it was gonna hit me and I've been saving that joke so thank you Jason um so we worked um uh, on um, his portfolio review preparation as well for him. So he was accepted into Review Santa Fe uh, for centers, the center's annual portfolio review, which is vetted. And as part of that, he really heavily focused on publishers. So we looked at who he was gonna meet with, but we focused heavily on publishers at that time. And he actually did meet his publisher there. So we followed up with them afterwards. And I'll show you some of the images from it. Um, we got them on the phone. We talked about how many, uh, how they work with artists, because a lot of publishers will now ask for subvention funds, and um, which is subvention is kind of like an investment. So you're essentially kind of investing in your own book, essentially paying for it, and then they'd have a lot of the overhead and marketing, go to book fairs, promote it, put it in catalogs, send out reps. So you're almost partnering with the publisher, but in a lot of ways, you're at least paying for the printing and production. But you usually don't pay for the overhead cost, but sometimes that might be different. Um, we also worked on contract negotiations. Two things I'll say with contract negotiations. A lot of them are boilerplate, but some of them are incredibly detailed. One thing you want to look for is the right to buy your remaining copies back, which could be destroyed or sold. And I know of some artists 
who whose work, books were actually chipped into the chipper and some people who um, were able to salvage it and buy their books for really cheaply um, back from the printer because a lot of times there's like storage issues and they'll just get rid of them. And then you want the right to terminate the contract um, and under what conditions you want to understand. And so we looked at the, we also looked at um, budgets for him and they kind of established, they sent him two bids for the production of the work. He got to choose the press. He got to look at samples for cloths and paper, cloth and paper and choose all the materials. He didn't have to pay for design because he had already laid out this very simple design. He had done all the sequencing himself. Um, and then the monies that he uh, used to pay for it, most of them, if not all of them, received from the Tulsa Artists Fellowship. So here's a few more of his work. So he Can was I able jump to jump in and ask you. So yeah. what? What is the who's the publisher he went with? Oh, it's Ain't Bad. Oh. Well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's uh, Dan's name, book, and his website. And you can actually, I think, get the book from Dan if you're interested in the book too, but you can learn a little bit more, look up him on, um, on the web too. The next one I wanna talk about is uh, Matt Schallenberger, his book, The Leaping Place. We worked together on some design suggestions, budget amendments, a publication timeline, licensing and rights, uh, marketing and publicity, fundraising around his Kickstarter setup. So the Leaping Place is um, his large format landscape images on the island of Hawaii and the photographs tell two ghost stories and I might read a little bit of this. First, uh, the photographer's own history and his family that immigrated to Hawaii in the 1880s from the Portuguese Azores. I want to leave that up just a sec. And the path of the images uh, built around the ancestors' record and recollections. And second, the Kumalipu, there we go, I had to look that one up again too, um, which is an ancient Hawaiian um, uh, creation. It's a Hawaiian chant that uh, Matt actually said was um, created in the 15 or 1600s and memorized and handed down until the 17, uh, well, well, until the 1700s when written language came in. And it wasn't actually, I think, written until the 1880s and then translated a few times uh, after that point. Um, he had started looking at books, the slide that's up here now, he had started looking at books and these, this is a collection of books that he had pulled together that were models for his books that he wanted to use. So he actually asked me for my suggestions too, but he had already put some of these together. So I think this is a really good thing. If you're starting to look at a book, start pulling up ideas. The other interesting thing I'll say about Matt is when he did speak to my class, he would use existing books, whether they're photo books or any other number of types of books that he liked the format so we could see how they would lay on the table how they could hold in his uh, people would hold them in their hands and he would place his own photos he would tape them in the book a lot of times so he could see what his images look like and you could do the same thing with blank books or you know if some kind of print-on-demand books but that's a good just use a book that you already have that's a really great publication uh, his book is kind of oblong long and it has somewhat of a Dutch design so it lays flat in the gutter he had created, uh, before we chatted, he had, he had a lot of materials already together. He already had a budget. He had talked to A&I Press in uh, LA, right there with you guys, I think, and, um, and kind of knew what they could do as far as design and printing. So he had a budget of $8,000. So um, he, oh, this is a copy of um, the epic poem. And um, he, he had a budget of $8,000 and he started his uh, Kickstarter with, um, I'm gonna go back to this one for just a second. He started his Kickstarter with a goal of $8,000. And so as soon as it reached the 8,000, so he pulled together his network. He's the one who said, don't be ashamed to go out and put yourself out there in the world. As soon as he has had his 8,000, he increased it to, I think 12,000. He reached that, he increased it to 16. Because the way Kickstarter works a lot of times, if you don't reach all your money, if you don't get all your money, if you don't reach your goal, you don't get any of your money. So once he reached that tier, then he decided to elevate it. So he knew 8,000 was kind of his base for what he wanted to produce. And he knew if he raised more, then he would get to do a better book at the time. 
So this, uh, this is the Hawaiian epic poem. This was actually from a, a translation, I think, that was done in um, 1951 and then later reproduced in 1971. Uh, I think it was Martha Beckwith, maybe her name, of University of Chicago. And as far as he could tell, the copyright had, they had not renewed the copyright on it, um, but he still wanted to get permission to do it. So he checked with the press to find out if he could still use it, and he did end up gaining um, the permission to use it. So that's another thing to think about is to think about how you're going to do with the licensing. And then he also kept a journal the whole time. And so you can see this page where it has all of his intricate notes um, with the Hawaiian chant. And with the limited edition, you got a facsimile reproduction of the book itself of all of his notes. But he did, he did include a few of those in, um, in the book itself too. So I'll show you a few of these. He also had to work with a local historical society to license some of the images. Some of these are uh, some of his family and then other ones are vernacular ones from the historical society. And the leaping place, the name of the leaping place comes from the idea of a location where you would go to convene with the ancestors. So he used some of these historical images that conveyed that, and then I think he used that as a jumping off point, <laughs> no pun intended, um, uh, for um, uh, the photographs that he took, his large format photos. Um, so I'll show you a few of these. The black and whites are from the Azores. So he kind of differentiates the images from his ancestral home um, versus his, where the home where he grew up with the color in the black and white. And this one I'll leave up for just a minute too. This is another one that we worked together on doing the press release. So one thing I'll say about the putting together the proposal materials, with some of the proposal materials, you'll get together your brief bio and um, the description uh, and then your specs and information about the limited edition too. Um, but you can use all of that copy if you're applying for grants, if you're like putting materials up on your website um, and then if you are um, uh, going to use it for a press release. So this has um, all of these the things in there too. So in thinking about who your audience is for the press release too, and make it pretty, make sure you make it like a beautifully designed object too. So we kind of work together to get this together and send it out um, before his book was out. And then always make sure, make sure, make sure that you put a way that they can contact you on the press release too. And then the uh, last one, uh, Matt Schellenberger, Leaping Place, and mattschellenberger.com. That's his website. Last one I want to show you guys is um, the one I was talking about with uh, Laura Webb Nichols, who has the archive of about 24,000 photos of hers, as well as other photographers who are around the area. She started to collect some of those too. So um, Nicole, I've met Nicole also at a portfolio review many years ago, and she, I, I used her images on the NPR picture show when I did a feature on, uh, so she's a photographer too. And she teaches at Humboldt University. She, uh, we worked together, we looked for a publisher, um, I advised her on the budget, we talked about grant applications, editing images, copy, editing the essays, because it was very uh, text heavy, um, design advising, and then we're working on, because the book is just coming out, um, and we're working on doing a limited edition and press release. So these are some of the images, and I think they're just amazing. I'm quite enamored with her. Um, uh, okay, so uh, let me tell you a little bit more about it. Um, so some of the, of the uh, some of her, uh, Nicole Jean Hill's friends had scanned some of the images in the 1990s. Um, they were on a like an archaic piece of material, a hard drive, and so they had to. They got permission for Nicole to use them. So Nicole scanned and I think made prints of about 2,000 of the images. She also got grants. Um, for the book project from the Wyoming Historical Society. Uh, no, I'm sorry, for the some of the scanning, I think, from the Wyoming Historical Society and Wyoming Cultural Trust to get these files um, to where they could be preserved. 
And she approached me, she originally wanted to do an academic book, and I kind of talked her out of it. And I said, I know this great Dutch publisher, FW Books, or uh, in uh, the Netherlands, and Hans Grimman, and he's an award-winning publisher. He wins awards almost every single year, and I said, I think that she could be a Vivian Mayer type character, where you could continually mine from this archives and produce book after book. And I said, save that, um, I was like, let's save that um, academic book for later. And now it's just coming out. So I, I, of course, after saying that, I hope it really, really does well. But I think it's an absolutely gorgeous book. Um, there was, um, Hans had asked for subvention funds as well as like a lot of publishers do when we approached him and we knew that would be the case. I think there's only maybe two or three that I know of that don't work, don't ask for funds up front from the photographer. Um, they're usually about like 12,000 to 40,000. With Hans, we were looking at about uh, 21,500 euros, so about $25,000. But Nicole and I kind of talked a good bit about the uh, budget. I'll show you a few more images. I love the long haired one. Um, uh, and then, and then we, um, and she used her, the Humble Foundation, the Humble Area Foundation. She got funding from that. She also got money from the Wyoming Community Fund because of um, Lord Webb Nichols and the associations up there with her in Wyoming, and she's at Humboldt. She was able to get money there. She also used her institution as an umbrella organization, as a fiscal sponsor, which I have another client who's working with um, Center as a fiscal sponsor to, to accept donations. Um, and she was able to write grants for this. So she got a, a $4,000 grant that I told her about one of the grants. And then she um, received a few other grant foundations. They went through the foundation at the school for a small administrative fee. And then the monies went straight out. So she didn't actually handle the cash. The monies went straight out to um, the publisher. And um, so you also don't have to worry about it for, I guess, for tax purposes too. And I love some of these. I'm just going to show you, go back here really quick. So I love uh, Hans. She sent all the images to Hans, um, the ones that have been scanned, I think about 100 to 200 images. I can't remember the number of plates, um, but he put a lot of these together. So this one actually does follow this one. And then there's that one. And there's this beautiful little corner of light that just relates to that. And I love this, um, the way his shirt goes down and the tent goes up. And, um, and then the way that this one, there's a lead in line from the bed that goes over to the window and then there's the bird and then the next page is another bird. <laughs> so, um, and this one, I love this beautiful contrast between old and new and modest and immodest and one gen older generation going into another, especially with the car in the background. So Hans laid a lot of these out, um, kind of uh, originally, I think Nicole envisioned, envisioned them to be chronological. So instead it became just this beautiful art object. And that's um, Nicole Jean Hill, Laura Webb Nichols in Campman, Wyoming, and laurawebbnichols.org and nicolejeanhill.com if you wanna look up any of them. And that's me again. And there's some of my library as it used to stand. So thank you all. Now I'll stop sharing now. Thank you, Melanie. Thank you so much. That was that was a whirlwind. They're the beautiful. Those last images are just extraordinary. They're just yeah. amazing. So I hope I didn't talk too fast. I recorded myself earlier, and I sounded like blah, 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 blah. <laughs> it's okay. I think we'll start having some questions, and yeah. um, and I can also just um, start off by asking you a few questions because I think you went through a lot of stuff really quickly. Um, yeah, blah, 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 blah. So when somebody comes to you, and as you said, they have a project. So the first thing you do is sort of, um, well, just go through it. What is the first thing you said? You ask them questions about how they envision the book, or how that what they're thinking of doing with the book, or, or you know, let's see, what kind of a book they want, or how do you? Yeah, yeah, where they are in the process, what they've okay. thought about, like why do they want a book? That's another thing that I emphasized and I think they kept coming up in that workshop I just taught and the three people we reviewed today at the end of the day and they said what I thought was so important for me that I got out of this workshop is why do I want to do this book? And right. then start to think about like that reason. So yeah, usually I kind of throw out a lot of questions that are I guess maybe somewhat philosophical in some ways, but a lot of it's like logistical too. And then how much money do you have? Right. Or what are you, what's your, what's your resources 
otherwise. Yeah, and I thought that was great. So you said basically, and, and this is it, there, with the exception of a very few amount of publishers, most publishers now want a buy-in and somebody said how much and you said between 12 and $40,000. That's about. Yeah, kind of. Uh, yeah. Would, and 40 is like a, kind of an extreme, but yeah, right. I, would, I would say that's a good range. You know, you're probably looking at a lot of people would say about 25 to 30 ish. Yeah. You know, but then you want to be really careful about the publisher too. And what's their marketing machine? Like, do they go to book fairs? What kind of book are they going to produce? If this is your only book, or if you're doing 1200 copies, right. and you sell 1200 copies and you're competing with them in some ways too, because you get a certain number of free copies that you can sell, but you can't sell to any bookstores that they have contracts with in some cases. Right. Or, or, so there's right. all these like sort of in, internal, this. and then you said you look at the contract with people, which is really fantastic. I mean, that's great because you have all this knowledge about sure. What? I'm not an attorney, though. No, I, I know. That. But you <laughs> understand the jargon. And I was going to say, you also recommend publishers to people. And you went really quickly through. And I will say, uh, for those who don't know, and I'll put it in the chat. So Photo Eye, which where Melanie used to work and ran the book uh, store for many years, Photo Eye is an incredible resource if you don't know about it already. They list all the publishers that, that they have their books. And they have an incredible array of books from around the world. And I think over 250 publishers or something, I mean, some in incredible amount of publishers um, listed on their site, literally with the list. And I think it's, uh, you can click and look at their websites and go to the publishers. Um, and then what you said, which I didn't realize many people have submission. They ha actually tell you how to submit to their, a lot of them say don't submit, obviously. But yeah. um, so one of the ones you said that did um, was Radius which I'm surprised yeah. they have, they're, they're like one of the top like books, you know, photo book makers, but yeah. they have, so for everybody there, we'll, I, I can put this radius in the chat too. If, if anybody doesn't know about radius books, they're incredible photo book. Yeah. And uh, they're a 501c3, they're a nonprofit. So they already have the gateway. If you like want to like get donations going in, um, I think that they could work in that way too, where you could get donations straight to them that goes towards your project. Yeah. And um, they also, they're 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 a little expensive too and then you have to go they're in high demand and and your book has to make it through the board approval interesting so yeah so um, you, send a, you send a basic submission and then and then they you get in a more in-depth one if they approve you i will say um you kind of you talked about this a little bit and and just um i wanted to get back to it so one of the ways people start have funds is kickstarter which a lot of people do and a lot of people probably uh have done before um or know about or have contributed to uh, people's Kickstarter. But the other, as you said, is if you can partner with a nonprofit, then they can take funds in for you. Um, and if you could just explain a little bit about how that works. Oh, there you go. Somebody just asked this, the fiscal donor concept. Yeah, well, um, so most people, it has to fit with the mission. And um, I don't know if Mika, I don't know, you might have been at Center before. I think, I don't know if your name looks familiar, yeah. Uh, I don't know if they're doing it for everyone. I think you might have to get uh, approval. You'd have to talk with them. But um, if the if you fit with their mission, some organizations are willing to do that and then they'll take it at, um, uh, administrative fee. And usually the administrative fee is probably about five to 15%. And then that's to kind of cover their overhead. Um, and then they'll send out a, um, for like with center, it has to be an, a certain amount. Like it has to be a hundred dollars for them to actually like do a nonprofit letter, but that's not, it's not a huge amount of money to ask from someone. And, um, and then they'll send a nonprofit letter, tax exempt letter. To, so it means basically you can get, yeah, exactly. So this is it. The reason to do this is so that people can donate to you and get a tax exempt letter. So it's yeah. like you're making a donation to a charitable organization mm -hmm. that's going towards your book. Yeah. Um, and, and if someone gave you $25,000, you know, then you got to pay taxes on that. You got to show it as income and all that too. So if it goes through them, they're the gateway and then it goes out. And then it goes right too. Yeah. yeah. And once and again, I know that there's um, an organization in New York, the, um, the, the, oh my gosh, I can't, the, the cracked world or something. I can't remember what it, what it is called. It'll come to me. Um, and they do this for people. They'll, um, they'll help nonprofits uh, uh, accept donations if they're not already known nonprofits. And they'll also help artists with this. Yeah, um, and, and <laughs> um, uh, Nicole was able to use her university foundation to right. write grants 
And also uh, there's another client that I've worked with who used their university to write grants too. So a lot of times you can't write grants as individuals. There's some grants you can, of course, you know, but some of them you can't, you have to be have a 501c3 entity. So you have to have a sponsorship entity that can write it for right. you. It's Fractured Atlas. I just thought of it. I'll put it in the okay. chat if anybody wants to check yeah. it out. Fractured Atlas will do that for people. Um, and um, yeah, and we have a question here. Somebody said, would you talk about self-publishing? What about self-publishing? Do you have a more? Uh, Karen, do you want to, do you want to, should we unmute you? Jason, are you still there? Can we? Yeah, yeah, just go ahead and uh, yeah. unmute and chime in. Yeah, hi. Um, I guess I just wondered, you know, what the pros and cons are of self-publishing. I know a lot of people do that now, and I guess you pay less money, but maybe you don't have any distribution. Mm -hmm. um, but for a small number of books, you know, what do you think about it? Oh, I think it's great, especially like, you know, having worked at Photo Art, we sold an incredible amount of self-published books. Um, I think that though, um, if you're looking for a particular audience, you may want to get feedback on it first, you know, do, do some cheaper versions or do like I was talking about with Matt, take some books that you already have and put your images in them, see how they kind of look. And just make sure you do some research with some of the design and it may be worth actually hiring a designer depending on what your budget is um, to get the book that you want. And then thinking about, I, I kind of feel like it's a little, probably a little better to start lower in the numbers and sell out than, you know, than doing 500 copies and not being able to sell them all. But if you did a hundred, you know, and then you know you've got a hundred people who would buy a $30 book from you. And also, you know, you don't want like a hundred people who would buy a $125 book from you. You know, so to kind of just figuring out exactly where you're going to place that and doing your research and audience and price point, perceived value. Like, so is it, you know, is it a small zine that I know one of my clients did with a print in it and sold it for $42, you know, but it's a very niche audience where it was a very geographically specific book. So it would have a very limited audience. So we only did a hundred of them. So there's endless ways that you could actually do self-publishing. Matt Schallenberger, who I sh showed you his book, his is self-published. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, and he wanted to actually produce it before he had a show in Hawaii. And with his Kickstarter, he did 444 copies. I think he likes the number four. And uh, 44 in the limited edition. Um, but he sold uh, over half the run in his Kickstarter campaign. So before it was even published. And where did he go to have it published? Uh, a and I. Oh, that's right. You said that, which is right here in LA. If anybody yeah. doesn't know about L a, a and I, they're a great publisher. Um, I mean, they're somewhat, I won't say they're somewhat like a blurb, but they are like blurb. You can basically design the book yourself and have the size you want and whatever uh, bells and whistles you want, and then they'll publish it for you. Or they'll print it for you. And there's a lot of places like that that are local. You just have to find out what they can do. Some of them down in Albuquerque, Starline used to have a six color Heidelberg offset press. So you could do like, you know, they just didn't have the binding capacity. So you might have to piggyback things together. So if you did, you know, you had it printed one place and then bound down the street or something like that, you know. So there's ways you could do hybrid models. Okay. Um, does uh, anybody else have any other questions? I'm just uh, trying to think of what we, what we talked about. Quite a, you covered, as I say, quite a bit. Uh, well, we talked, you said you talk a little bit at the end about marketing. So... Go ahead and yeah. Oh, your... no, no, no. That's I was just saying earlier on. I think that um, that uh, we're starting to do some of Nicole Jean Hill's marketing, and I did a little bit with um, Matt Schallenberger. But I think that you got to kind of start building up your resources right away. And I have, and and then there's an ebb and flow of resources too, because early on, you know in the 2000s at some point, like our 2010s, whatever, you know, there were a lot of people who were out there doing blogs and they were like, a, it was a good place to actually get some of your work. And now it, that might not be the most ideal venue, but then there's still some online magazines and there's still a lot of online venues. I think you just got to kind of start immediately um, paying attention. Um, so being We've lost, we've lost Melanie for the second. Hopefully she'll come back. Yeah, she'll probably pop right back in. Shoot. And to, to make something new, but think out of the box. We, about like we lost you for a second, Melanie. So can you repeat that? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, you got me now? Yes. Okay. Oh, I got on the wrong internet. Oh, sometimes my internet just does that. Um, 
uh, it's just to think out of the box about how you're going to market things, you know, like you you've got a, a photo book on on uh, gun presence in New Mexico and in, in New Mexico or whatever would garden and gun be interested in that or something, you know, just like start thinking of or thinking of ways where you could place it and um, and get other different interviews and just start putting yourself out there. So somebody asked, do you feel like having a website is mandatory for someone publishing a book? Uh, for the book project just itself or for um, Warren? I don't know, Warren, do you want to, do you want to talk? You can unmute yourself. Yeah, I'll get you to. Uh, okay, here I am. Okay. <laughs> um, for the total of the book and the artist and uh, the photographer, um, is it mandatory? For I, if I, I would, if I were you, I would have a website for your work for sure. And then, but I don't think it's necessarily mandatory to have a separate site for the book. Okay. But you might want to have a, a site where within the, your page for the book. And I would most definitely look into ways to do e-commerce on there so people could buy it um, right away through there. Even Thank like you. platforms like PayPal, you can put buttons in there if you know a little bit about code. If not, you can do Google searches on how to insert code. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. And I think Matt, I mean, Mark had a, do you want to, you want to, you want me to look at the chat? Uh, sure. Uh, Mark said, uh, go ahead. No, what would be the fee process for looking at your, your fee or process for looking at an existing self-published book that was done as a mock-up? Well, my rates are 125 now. Yeah. An hour, an hour or a pro project or? It's 125 an hour. I'm working on a project uh, based, uh, I'm going to increase them at the beginning of the year, but um, I'm looking at a project based um, way to work to with a flat fee, but that one would probably be on an approval basis. So I'd have to know for sure that this is something that I could do justice to. So I'd have to feel very confident that I could bring your project to fruition. So for that reason, it would be something that um, uh, maybe aesthetically that I would really believe in, but something that I think that I could take it through to the end. So that would be the one way I would accept it. But on an hourly fee, it's, it's 125 right now. And then we have another question, which is, have you had any clients that have created photo artist books, handmade objects, and typical buyers of these books of special collection libraries? Um, clients, uh, I've not worked with any, but I've known of a lot of people who've done it. And I've also worked with a, a few special collections libraries uh, in placing books. So, um, but no, um, oh, hey, Victoria. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, I've... Um, I, I, have n I have not worked with them just to do that. Uh, I mean, I'm not opposed to that and I don't have, I mean, I do have a little bit of a background in it. So, but um, yeah, Victoria, do you have, do you have a little bit more to that question? Is there? Oh, can anyway. I, oh no, I just, I just wanted to know that's sort of uh, my path. And, um, you know, I think there's always this uh, sort of uh, between uh, photo artist books and then like the other side of photo books, there's that little, um, that, that gray area. And so I just wanted to know if, you know, if you had any experience with that. Yeah. No, not, not directly working with someone who is a client. But other other than that, I think you and I met a, a yes or something. Yeah. yeah. Um. So yeah. I've probably seen some of yours. But um. But yeah. So I've I've worked with people usually through photo eye and then selling some of them. Um. Like I sold um, Dana. Um. Now I'm drawing a total blank on Dana's name. Does uh, it start with an M? Maybe. Uh, I'll think of it in just a second. Um, but we, we did her little artist book and she worked, she actually did four of each. She did a little scroll and then an accordion fold of the same project. And she had it done by Dats Press in Korea, but she only did four of each. So there were, oh, four, uh -huh. they were $400 a piece, which I thought they actually should have been more than that. But um, so yeah, I, I've sold some through the bookstore and when I was at Photo Eye too. But. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, nice to see you. Thanks. And tell yeah. us about Grenade in a Jar. You sort of mentioned it in the beginning, but 
tell us about well, that. Well, kind of, I kind of let it have a little long COVID started. Um, you know, I got back from a portfolio review, but I'm going to start uh, kind of ramping it up again too. So probably next week I'll send out an email. Um, uh, and, and just tell us what it is for those who don't so it's know. A book, it's a bookstore. It's a curated bookstore, a vetted bookstore of just books that I kind of like and want to promote. Yeah. So, and I'm probably going to narrow the focus a little bit over the couple we next couple of weeks, maybe do some more book reviews on my own. So I sell them and fulfill them. And because I sell them and fulfill them, I might limit how many I actually sell of each one because it becomes quite a lot to ship them out. But yeah, they're just books I really like and want to sell. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah. Um, and do we have any other questions from anybody? Uh, there was one a client had a projects that have appealed to more mass market audience. Um, not really that much. There was one photographer I was working with for a little while who was doing a book on tea in China. And, um, and he had this amazing vision. He was going to do about 8,000 copies. And he lived in China, though, so he knew the market really, really well. But he was actually going to do an installation of it, too. So there would be this, so he would shop it around uh, as an installation of the history of tea. And he would have this big, beautiful coffee table object um, that would go along with it. So I have not worked with anyone directly with that. I did sell a lot of those, especially early on at PhotoEye, because when I started, that's mostly, you had a, a few self-published books, but you had a lot of just mass market appeal books that we would actually sell. So I do have a little experience, but not firsthand, which is to with a client. Did you see that? So is there a specific way to present a book project or to you or a publisher, like a PDF or a specific program? Well, there's, um, there's an argument too. There's a, a video that I had some of my students watch from Gerhard Steidel, and um, he's one of the most well-known publishers, and he's out of Germany. And he had said, uh, people said, do you want a PDF? He's like, no, I, I'm like, I don't want to do a German accent. I won't try to do a German accent. <laughs> That's horrible. Um, but he's like, no, I look at, you know, PDFs all day. I'm never ending. He said, but go into your, your studio and make a plummy. He called it a plummy, plummy book. Like, so I think, I don't know if he's talking about a dummy book or if he was talking about plummy, like luscious and beautiful and sweetness. And, um, but he said, go make a dummy book. And I want to see that. Oh, okay. But Interesting. Then, uh, but a lot of people will tell you, you just send them a PDF of images. Right. And so I feel like I kind of do like this hybrid model of getting together the proposal to tell people what it's about, putting a lot of images in there. There's some design, some publishers who don't want to see a design book because they don't want to see your vision. They want to do their own vision. Some of them want to see a little bit of a book because they want to see what the images look like in a book. Some of them want to see your vision of what the book should look like. And I've known of a few photographers whose books have been published almost facsimile versions um, by publishers of what they actually did as a dummy book. Mm -hmm. So if you're really fixed on your vision, then I would say, do it, do your little dummy book. Otherwise, I think just a good PDF uh, of images with an introduction, even as a minimum, is a good way to start. But the best way is network and to know some people too. Just foster as many relationships as you can. Yeah, I think that, yes. I mean, that's always good advice in terms of just asking who you know and asking people if they know of publishers or people who'd be interested in your work too, so. Mm -hmm. And other, other photographers who you might know have published with a certain publisher and say, hey, what did you think about working with them first? Yeah. And then if it was a good experience, then, hey, maybe you introduce me. <laughs> what can I, can I take you out for drinks or whatever, you know? Yeah. No, I think that's always, uh, that's good advice. I think, as you said, I mean, you have to just put yourself out there. You just have to, and even uh, accept if, if they say no, or, you know, even if they're your friend and they say, like, I don't think it'd be appropriate, or I don't like, you know, yeah. but I think even asking acquaintances, um, you know, yeah, this is my work, and I'm looking for a publisher. I think the more you put it out there, the more likely it is that somebody's going to say, oh, yeah, I know, you know, this publisher or that publisher might be interested in it, so. Yeah. Good. Uh, anything else, anybody? I feel like we have a very quiet audience tonight. <laughs> well, Zoom does that too. Yeah. I know, <laughs> but it's okay. Uh, yeah, did everybody find out everything they wanted to know? I guess they... I said everything. You said everything. You said <laughs> everything. <laughs> 
Well, if, if that's it, then, uh, then I'm just going to say thank you, Melanie. That it was really, really informative. Yeah. And um, Thanks, we everybody. all learned a lot. And uh, look at Melanie's uh, website. She put it out there a couple times, or I put it out there, but I don't think it linked, sorry. Um, but you can find her, Melanie McWhorter. Um, if you can spell McWhorter, then you can if you can spell If you can spell McWhorter, uh, yes. If you, you can, can find just it. spell it sometime, you can probably find it. Right? Yeah. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Uh, and then, nice. yeah. So you can get all the, like, thank yous. Yeah, thank Yes, you. lots of people thanking you. I think it yeah. was great. It was a terrific present presentation. Thank you so much Good. for being all here. All right, well, have a nice evening. And thanks Everybody, have a, have a great evening. And I'll talk to you soon. I hope to see all of you maybe one day.